La linguistique qui étudie le langage est naturellement liée à nombre d'autres disciplines. Nous pouvons penser à la sociologie, la neuroscience, l'histoire, la géographie, l'anthropologie, les sciences du calcul et la génétique des populations. Mais peut-être la diffusion et l'évolution des phonèmes et des dialectes peut-elle être décrite mathématiquement par des modèles inspirés de la mécanique statistique Mon invité pour cet épisode, James Burridge, pense que c'est le cas et explique comment il a implémenté ses idées dans ses travaux de recherche. Linguistics, the study of language, is naturally linked to many other disciplines. One can think of sociology, neuroscience, history, geography, anthropology, computational science, and population genetics. But perhaps the spread and evolution of sounds and dialects can be described mathematically by some models inspired from statistical physics. My guest for this episode, James Burridge, argues that this is the case and explains how he implemented these ideas in his research. So I'm thrilled to be here with Dr. James Burridge. Uh, James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for coming. So you are now a senior lecturer at Portsmouth University and uh, you conduct your research in the Department of Mathematics. Yep. I think you obtain your PhD from Cambridge University, but I was not able to find the year when you graduated or the title of your thesis. Uh, yes, I did. Now, uh, early, to, early in this century. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. And the thesis, I think, was something like a theoretical study of three statistical systems. I think that's what it was. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so thanks for filling in with the information. Uh, so you use probabilities and statistical physics to study different things, including social phenomena and specifically language and evolution in space and time. That's right. I mean, the evolution of language. Um, so I learned about your work when I encountered your, your, your article, Spatial Evolution of Human Dialects, which was published about a year ago now in the scientific journal Physical Review X. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you first, what made you want to use uh, mathematical or maybe physical, depending on what on how one sees it, uh, mathematical met methods to study ge ge excuse me, geographical dialect evolution? And what made you think it could be a relevant approach? Okay, so um, I'd worked on quite a few different things uh, over the last, say, sort of six or seven years. And a couple of years ago, um, Uh, it suddenly dawned on me that uh, it would be really interesting to try and uh, cook up some statistical physics of um, two-dimensional social systems. So sort of think of, think of social systems as two-dimensional physical systems, basically, which actually there's mm -hmm. nothing original at all about that idea. Uh, you know, the, the deeper <laughs> I got into it, the more I realized how many other people have been trying to do that. Um, so basically, naively, I, I, I thought about the, the aspects of two-dimensional physical systems that interested me, and I'm really interested in geometrical things. So naturally, I'm interested in these, these domain walls that appear in magnetic systems. So you, in, in a magnet, you, uh, what, what, essentially what makes it magnetic is the uh, alignment of the atoms. And, um, but what you find is that in different parts of a magnetic material, the alignment can be in different directions. And then you have uh, uh, the point at which the direction switches forms either a line or a surface called, called a domain wall. And, uh, and I thought, oh, well, these domain walls, they must, they must come up in uh, cultural phenomena. They just, they just have to be there somewhere. Where because people like to align their culture, they like to copy each other and line themselves up culturally. So, you know, they, they should line themselves up in one direction in one place and a different direction in another place. So as you move from place to place, you should see that alignment switching. Uh, so I thought, okay, well, the, these, these domain walls have got to be somewhere. So I just went looking for them. And um, the first place I found them with it was in uh, birdsong dialects. Mm -hmm. uh, so I That was that was where it started, really. So, so working on this bird called a Puget Sound white crowned sparrow, which lives up the uh, Pacific uh, northwest coast of the USA, 
and it has a it has a dialect in the sense that its mating call has a terminal trill, um, a little noise at the end of its call. And you, as you go up the coast, you find all the males have the same terminal trill. And then over the space of a sort of half a kilometre or so, the terminal trill completely switches to something else. And then it carries on with that new pattern for another sort of 100 kilometres. And then 100 kilometres later, it completely switches again. And essentially, that's the, what, what a physicist would call a striped state. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and you see striped states in, in, in magnetic systems. So the, so, the, so the game was basically then to see if we could understand the life cycle of these birds and, and understand the connection between their life cycle and, and uh, sort of the classic models of, of striped states in, in magnetic materials. Right. And then you moved on to humans. Yeah, I mean, humans are much more difficult. Um, uh, and, um, I mean, a nice thing about the birds is that their territories are just on a kind of coastal strip all the way up the northwest coast of America. So they're, they're, system, they're, they're essentially a, a quasi-one-dimensional system. And mm-hmm. in physics, one-dimensional systems are a million times easier to understand than two-dimensional <laughs> ones. And obviously people, people pe- you know, Human societies are essentially two-dimensional systems, or even, or even worse, and, and you know they're getting less and less two-dimensional as time goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe you could uh, briefly, you know, introduce uh, the the model that you used in this article. So I don't know where we should start from. I mean, something that maybe uh, we can mention early on is that your model is. Uh, relevant in what one could call quiet times, uh, meaning that you are not uh, describing what happens during times of conquest or maybe large migrations. Yes, that's right. Okay. okay. So will I start from there? Yeah, please, if you can. Okay, so the, the model is incredibly simple. I mean, it, the only assumption is that people listen to and then copy uh, other people with whom they meet in their everyday lives, and their everyday lives are centered around a small geographical area, maybe sort of 10, 20 kilometers, but that's a parameter of the model anyway. So essentially, you, you spend most of your life, or you spend significant amounts of time wandering around a sort of a home range and conversing with people and just simply picking up the most common linguistic features in your geographical area and, and conforming to those. And then that's essentially the model. I mean, it, it, it really is that simple. And of course, the point is that in a, if there are major kind of upheavals or wars or migrations, then you violate those assumptions because you, 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 you transport a huge number of people and their linguistic memories to a new location, and you essentially reset the system with, with some new initial conditions. Mm-hmm. So the assumption is stability, essentially, um, and what's called normal contact. Right. Okay. Um, so you also write in the article that uh, we represent dialects using a set of linguistic variables, and we suppose that speakers have a tendency to adapt their speech over time in order to conform to local conventions of language use. Uh, This is, in a way, what you just described, Uh, but maybe you can uh, elaborate on what you mean by linguistic variables. Okay, so um, a linguistic variable is simply a convenient way of uh, describing a particular language or dialect and how it differs to another dialect. So... Uh, simple examples of linguistic variables are just the term for a certain thing or uh, a certain object or animal or something like that. So, uh, for example, in um, in England a couple of hundred years ago, there were lots of names for hedgehog, uh, local names mm-hmm. for hedgehog, like furs pig or um hedgehog or yeah i can't remember any other ones but there's some there were some funny funny names to hedgehog and so you so you um a linguistic variable is simply the local name for a hedgehog uh mm-hmm. or it could be the pronunciation of a particular vowel sound you know uh 
if you break down speech into a kind of phonet- you decompose it phonetically, you find that there are certain uh, vowels that are pronounced in quite different ways depending on where you are in a country. So you can have a linguistic variable which is just the the sound of a particular vowel depending on where you are. Um, there are lots of technicalities when you get into the sort of serious linguistics. It, it gets a bit more complicated, but essentially that's that's what we're talking about different words for things different ways of pronouncing things different grammatical structures they can all be just enumerated as 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 variables mm-hmm. so one way of describing the the model is um with the following heuristics i guess which is that um people hear others speaking around them they remember the way they they spoke or you know, as, as you just explained, it can be specific words but for specific things, or it could be specific uh, phonetical uh, features. And then they essentially um, emulate what they have heard. Right. And the really important thing is that they are able to distinguish what the locally dominant form is. So in, in the following sense, so if more than percent, more than 50% of people call sweet fizzy drinks soda then mm-hmm. other people are able newcomers or pe- people young people are able to perceive that 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 soda is the dominant form it's it's it, more than 50% of the majority of the population are using it and their response to that is to use it even more than the current majority you know, so suppose 70% of the people are using soda, then, then if that's what our memory of the usage is, we remember 70% of people using it, we might use it 75%. Or our mm-hmm. probability of using it is more than the current usage frequency if that usage frequency is bigger than 50%. So we're able to kind of emphasize the, the local, locally dominant forms. And that's the, the, there's a very important difference between that kind of behavior and something called neutral evolution, which is the sort of classic model of the evolution in, of genes, the sort of simplest model of genetic evolution, where uh, genes or linguistic variants, if you like, are reproduced in the next generation essentially with the same frequency, plus or minus a bit of noise, as they were in the last. So there's no emphasizing the dominant ones. Mm-hmm. And they're very different. And, and if you, with neutral evolution, you don't get surface tension. You don't get bubbles. You do get regional variations, but the mechanism which generates those variations is not surface tension. Okay, so are there any uh, observations that you know, motivate this, this choice of the, um, I don't know how to call it, this sort of, super neutral and non-neutral um, emulation whereby, you know, it's what you just explained, whereby people are, you know, likely to use the dominant form than one would conclude by just looking at the frequency. Well, um, so one thing you can do is just look at distributions, probability distributions or frequency distributions for given linguistic variants. So you can, mm-hmm. if, you, if you assume neutral evolution, you can essentially work out what the, what the distribution of different linguistic variables would be. And then you can assume non-neutral evolution, surface tension type in, uh, evolution, and do the same thing. And you can compare those distributions to reality. And, and essentially what you find with, non, with non-neutral evolution is you get a kind of a little peak, you, you, you get little peaks in the distribution which show that there are dom- locally dominant features, and those peaks are much harder to find in neutral evolution. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. And also, I mean, the other, I mean, the honest answer really is <laughs> it, non-neutral evolution generates domain walls. These nice domain walls that has, have interesting properties. And linguists have been drawing lines on maps, call, calling them isoglosses, and they just look like domain walls. 
So the obvious thing to do if you're a physicist trying to understand what the linguists have done is to just borrow the whole idea of domain walls and just see if they see if it works as an idea, basically. Um, and then mm. that the truth is that's what I did, and um, uh, and it's only uh, and I'd still say it's an open question whether linguistic evolution is neutral or not, and I'm, I'm still working on it. I'm, I'm still interested in whether the patterns of uh, the geographical patterns of language use need surface tension in order to explain them or whether neutral evolution is is a perfectly good model do mm. so, you know if people have tried to assess this you know sort of empirically by doing some observation uh, on the ground i guess it would be like unrealistically tedious well and, and long i don't know well i mean the the there's a recent paper, actually, um, I think about sort of six months ago by somebody called Carl, Han Carl Hannon, I think I've pronounced that right, and it, basically about this question, you know, is, is linguistic evolution neutral or not? And I think it, it, mm. it's becoming a more and more interesting topic uh, that quite a few people are interested in. Um, and I, 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 I'm actually currently working uh, to try and give some evidence that it's not neutral. Um, with a with a linguist at Cambridge, uh, Bert Vo and some other collaborators, um, and I, I don't know other people may be doing things as well, uh, but I, I don't know of any kind of really solid uh, big data evidence one way or the other. But there's, there's certainly some excellent, really really excellent work on linguistics by physicists, for example, um, um, Richard Blythe. Um, uh, there's a thing called the utterance selection model, which is uh, very influential, and that's essentially a neutral model. Um, and I, I think they would have the, the authors of that would have quite a lot to say about whether neutrality is, is is right or not. Okay, okay. So I guess we should keep an eye, an eye on that. But yeah, I, I'm impressed that people have you know started to actually try and check it uh, empirically. Um, Maybe we can spend some some time on um, explaining what these isoglasses are, uh, isoglasses are because you you just mentioned them, and I think we will need to understand that once we reach the uh, results part of the discussion. Okay, so um, so linguists or dialectologists is a sort of, are a kind of subgroup of linguists who are interested in in, in human dialects. A dialect being essentially a of a, a different version of a language, a locally distinctive version of a language, and, and, a, and a kind of classic way to investigate the um, geographical variations in, in dialects is to do big linguistic surveys where, where a linguist, linguist would go uh, into, a, into a local community and ask a whole series of questions about words for things and how pronunciations worked, um, record those, you know, re record those results at all sorts of different places within a country, and then essentially plot, draw little maps with different symbols representing different linguistic forms. And often what they would find is that big patches of the map would have one symbol, and then there would be a very, fairly, fairly rapid change to a different symbol, um, and the line across which that change took place was called an isogloss. Uh, so essentially mm -hmm. meaning... Um, a line of kind of constant speech, a kind of level curve of, of linguistic forms. So you, you, mm -hmm. you, you, you go across an isoglass and people start calling hedgehogs something different or they start pronouncing their vowels differently. Or, and the point is an isogloss only corresponds to one linguistic variable, uh, but obviously a dialect requires all sorts of distinctive variables. and so. What what you what you often find is that isoglosses, what's called bundle together, they often follow a similar geographical route. And when you cross an isogloss mm -hmm. bundle, you're crossing lots and lots of isoglosses all at once. And and then when that happens, you notice quite a big linguistic change. So so people start to sound really really distinctive. Mm. Okay. Do you think it's possible for you to explain the fundamental evolu evolution equation of your model in plain words? Uh, I could have a go. Um, mm. So 
the whole thing revolves around memory. So uh, the, the thing that's evolving in the model is, is linguistic memory. And really, you can think of that as essentially a tape recorder that's running, that's endlessly recording. But um, the, the thing is that the, the older the recordings get, the less important they get to the decisions that people make now about how they speak. And um, essentially what the equation says is that the rate of change of your linguistic memory is essentially, there are two things going on. First of all, uh, your linguistic memory is being pushed towards the current type of speech. And second, it's diffusing in a sense that you are, you're drawing your memories from people nearby. And, and essentially, mm -hmm. there's two terms in the equation. One of them says, conform to local speech forms. And the other one says, listen to, listen to the way people are speaking in the next town along uh, and copy them. Uh, and, and that's the equation to two terms, diffusion and conformity, mixing and conformity. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, and so what, what branch of physics is this model inspired from? It's well, so the model really, the equation, although it deals with memory, it, it actually mm -hmm. ends up looking an awful lot like a classic equation of statistical physics called the Ginsberg-Landau, mm -hmm. well, the time-dependent Ginsberg-Landau equation. Uh, and that is a very well-known and old equation invented by some of the best physicists that ever lived um, to describe domain walls uh, or, the, or the, the evolution of ordering in magnetic systems. Um, yeah. Uh, so but essentially, it, it's, the equation is a time-dependent Ginsberg-Landau equation. Uh, but it, it's derived differently and it's got some slight variations because it's handling memory rather than the, the orientation of, my, of uh, atoms. Mm -hmm. So by now, hopefully the audience uh, understands the hypothesis of the model. They understand the um, evolution equation. Um, do you think it's time to move on to the results? Do you want to add something before? No, that's... That, I've... I've probably said too much about the, the model. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite right, actually. That's, uh, that's what we set out for. We want to, to explore things in detail in the podcast. Okay. It's, it's really good. good. Um, yeah, so I don't, know. I don't know if we should explore this um, first or last, but um, one can mention, at least briefly for now, that the results are stable uh, with respect to the initial conditions. Yes, that's right. So essentially, you, you, the initial conditions of the model are a kind of primordial soup. So every, everybody's speaking a kind of random language. And the point, the point about doing that is that obviously that wasn't how, you know, that's not a, that's not a realistic representation of history. It's, it's, not, it's not like everybody was using kind of random uh, linguistic variables completely different to their neighbors. But the point, the reason for doing that, the reason for starting with a primordial soup is that we literally, we just don't know what the real initial conditions are. So what we need to show mm -hmm. is that it really doesn't matter how we start. We can start with completely crazy initial conditions. And as long as we always end up with uh, the same answer, we can then claim that actually initial conditions don't matter. So, so the idea mm -hmm. is you, you start with something completely crazy, a whole range of crazy starts, and just verify that, that as long as you leave things alone for long enough, you'll end up in roughly the same state. But I should add that there are an awful lot of... So what we're actually studying here is isoglosses, which are, which are these wiggly lines that you know, crisscross the country. And so when you, when, you, when you restart, you recreate your primordial soup, you will get a, a random isogloss. You, you run the model, you'll get, eventually you'll get a nice wiggly line out in the end. And every time you run the model, you'll probably get a slightly different wiggly line. But what you find is that the number of wiggly lines you can get at the end is minuscule in comparison to the range of primordial soups you could start with. And what you find is mm -hmm. that if you superimpose all of the wiggly lines on top of each other, you start to get a very, very clear pattern. 
Um, and, and, and the more primordial soups you explore, the more, the, the clearer that pattern becomes. So there's this kind of, there's this kind of inexorable uh, uh, kind of journey towards this same pattern. Uh, so it's, it's like the pattern you get has to happen in a way. It's a kind of geometric inevitability. As long as you don't have any wars or, um, you know, major migrations. <laughs> and so now to the, the big question, what is the final answer that you get? Well, I mean, so the claim is that the, the geographical pattern of dialects in any country should be predictable simply by the shape of the country and the distribution of the people in the country. So where the, where the big towns are, where the mountain ranges are, the shape of the coastline. And um, so I, 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 I solved the model for the UK and for, and for Italy and compared the results to um, some sort of classic dialect maps Uh, created by linguists and find quite a good match. Um, but I would say that there is, there is more work to be done. I, I don't think the model is the whole answer. I think it gives some sort of nice looking results and, and is, a, is a sort of neat description of, of what's happening. And it kind of spontaneously creates isoglosses and tells you some interesting things about the way they evolve. But there is, there's definitely more going on. And I think that uh, mm. because, I mean, for one thing, the, the, the model of the way that people interact is extremely simple. You know, it, my model is extremely simple. And, you know, we know that certainly in modern times, people interact over really quite long distances. And there the, were the, these long range communication links that just aren't in the model. Um, but mm. I think that it, in the tradition of statistical physics, we just start with the absolutely minimal model we can and see what that tells us and see how much we can explain with that model. And um, we do that first before we start making it more complicated. Sure. So <clears throat> maybe we can discuss, uh, this will be interesting, you know, possible extensions to the model uh, in a few minutes. Um, before we do so, can you explain in some more detail the role played in shaping the isoglosses by the... Um, the role played by the coastlines, for example, or uh, the cities as well? Okay, so I, I think cities are probably the most important. Well, I mean, okay, so let's start with cities. So essentially the idea with the city is that uh, if you live on the edge of a city, then all things being equal, you probably have more conversations with people who live in the, within the city, further in than you at least, than you do with people who live outside. Because if you didn't, you'd have to sort of be deliberately making quite a lot of effort to avoid speaking to city people because there's just so many of them to talk to compared to the number of people who live, you know, further out. And the upshot of that is your linguistic tape recorder is focused further in towards the city. It's picking up more linguistic information from, from closer to the middle of the city than it is to the outside. And what that means is that you have a tendency to conform to the city dialect. And, and the result of that is that if you're living on an isogloss that goes around the city, that is, you're on sort of the transition point between the city dialect and the country dialect, because you're listening to more city people than country people, you're likely to switch to the city dialect and If lots of people around you are also switching, that'll push, that'll push the, the isogloss out. So the city, the, mm -hmm. you think of the, the isogloss as a kind of bubble surrounding the city. Um, the city essentially exerts pressure on the bu bubble, pushing it out. Now, there's an opposite mm -hmm. effect, and that's that um, loops, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a, a, a bubble surrounding a city, it's, it's, it's curved. And if you live on a curved isogloss, simply the curvature alone can mean that you're more likely to speak to, you'll hear more people on one side than the other. Uh, sure. And so there's, there's two competing effects. So cities blow out the bubbles and curvature tries to suck them in again. And so they reach this kind of stable mm -hmm. equilibrium. And that's one way of explaining why often cities have these distinct speech forms is that that they're sort of the, 
the surface tension is pushing the bubble in, trying to shrink the bubble around the city. And the fact that cities are denser as you go towards the middle is pushing them, pushing the bubble out again, and it reaches a kind of equilibrium. Um, you know, and, and equilibrium is the kind of extent of the city dialect. So that's that's what cities do in the model. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure a linguist would have an awful lot more to say about it than um, I, I do. <laughs> uh, but um, and then the other thing is these um, the shape of the country. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, now, the, in uh, in physical systems, you often find that if the, syst the physical system has a high aspect ratio, meaning it's kind of long and thin, then you then you get domain wars. You get changes in physical ordering, but the the, the changes tend to cr happen across the short side of the system. So the the domain wall will will cross a, will go across the short side. Another way of putting it is. Uh, if you, I don't know, um, you, you'd be on, if suppose you had a kind of tube, a glass tube with a mm -hmm. bubble inside it, the bubble is very unlikely. Well, the bubble's going to, it's going to kind of close off the tube. It's not going to run all the way along the tube flat. Uh, I'm not sure it's a great analogy, but essentially the, the point <laughs> is that, that these, 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 these domain walls tend to, tend to find the shortest routes across systems. So, and in the same way, they try that isoglosses should try to find the shortest route across a country, uh, a bit like a bit like a, a geodesic in a, uh, a bit like a ray of light. It tries to find the quickest path, the shortest path. So mm. it's they're, they're essentially isoglosses that are geodesics, um, these these curve these shortest possible curves that run across countries. Except they're not straight lines because the local geometry, the local sort of the distance metric is warped by population um, mm -hmm. density. So the population density essentially creates a kind of curvature in the two-dimensional space. And so straight lines are no longer, sorry, short lines, the shortest lines are no longer straight, but slightly curved. Okay. Yeah. So I have one more question about the, the results, which, is, um, which concerns the time scale. Um, you know, because you you're able to reproduce uh, with some, some accuracy the, the current uh, dialectical map of England, for instance. Um, but what's the time scale, you know, in, in you know, actual human, <laughs> human units um, over which the simulation, um, I mean, not over which it's run, but what's the time scale to which the simulation corresponds in, in real life? So okay. Is there a way of assessing there this? There is. Um, so there's a, there's a parameter which actually disappears from the equations called memory length. Uh, so that's basically uh, how long it takes for a bit of your linguistic memory to cease being important. So, you know, essentially how far back in the past you care about the way, the way people were talking. So, I mean, mm -hmm. let's say that that's, say, 10 years or 20 years, like you you just you just don't care the way we speak, people were speaking twenty years ago when you're deciding how to speak now. Um, and actually, there are a lot of complexities here because uh, young people effectively have a very short memory length because their speech is rapidly changing. But older people, they kind of uh, they they kind of freeze out and they they it's much harder for them to change their speech. So effectively, they've got very long memories. But let's say the memory length is let's say something like ten or twenty years. And that's our unit of time in the model. So one unit of time is one memory length. And mm -hmm. you, if you start off for a kind of primordial soup, after about 10 or 20 memory lengths, everything is pretty much decided. I mean, that's, it, the system kind of slows down a lot uh, once it starts to kind of find its equilibrium. But you can kind of see what the eventual pattern is going to be after, say, 10 or 20 memory lengths. So a, f a few hundred years, say. So if you if you leave, mm. leave start things in a big mess a couple of centuries ago, after after a, a couple of centuries, you'd expect things to have kind of uh, settled down to a, a fairly stable pattern. Right. So it's actually it's actually pretty fast. Yeah, but of course things keep happening though, and re the conditions yeah. keep resetting. And you know there there were who knows what the real human memory length is. Mm. Another question. Yeah. So 
Yeah, I mean, do, do you think we we can talk about the um, possible extensions to the muzzle? Uh, yeah, I mean, so the 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 data that I was using to calibrate to sort of test the model were these kind of fairly traditional dialect maps, dialect atlases, um, mm -hmm. and what we'd really like, what I'd really like to do, is use big data sets, you know, really, really big um, uh, linguistic surveys or social media data, uh, which give you really high resolution maps of, of what's going on. So one of the first things to do, and one of the things I'm doing at the moment, is getting hold of these big data sets and running the model on, on that data. And what I'm finding is, so I've been working on um, the United States with uh, data uh, in what's called the Survey of World English, which was it's it's the it's the biggest linguistic survey by a long way, and it was initiated by by Bert Vo uh, at the University of Cambridge. And um, what essentially what we're finding there is that I think partly because of the fact that the American population density is quite kind of concentrated in cities, uh, and the upshot of that is that really we ought to be thinking about the interactions as being on a network rather than a kind of smooth two-dimensional space. So the, the, the first mm. extension is to start thinking about everything as a network. And the second extension is to say, okay, well, let's not, um, let's not force these interaction strengths between different nodes of the network, that is different towns and cities. Let's not force them to be some kind of... Um, very, very simple uh, uh, mathematical form that we guessed was right. Let's try and figure out mm. what this, these network interactions are by looking at the data. So essentially, mm. what I'm trying to do at the moment is take lots and lots of di different linguistic variables and then reverse engineer what the social network is from those variables and then say, well, okay, I, I think I know what the network is. Now let's run the same model on that network and check that it does reproduce the kinds of patterns that the, the survey is showing. Uh, so basically, the, the, the big extension is to start thinking of everything as a network. Um, mm. And of course, then there are other extensions like um, adding different kinds of linguistic copying in. So my, my original model was non-random and all about conformity. So I've been experimenting with uh, random neutral evolution and uh, m models where people just completely ignore what other people are doing and just make their own minds up about the way they want to speak. And it, it turns out a, a kind of combination of those three things, you know, random neutral evolution, conformity, and just completely ignoring everything, everyone else is actually quite effective in describing the, the actual real distribution that you get out of really high quality data mm -hmm. um yeah are, uh, are you interested in uh, including the effects of um non-local interactions because i guess you know many people would argue that throughout the 20th century languages in in given countries have you know uniformized to a large extent through uh, radio and television yes uh yes yeah, so i am interested in that and I, in fact I, I wrote a second paper um which came that came out early this year uh dealing with long-range interactions and some other things like um p random migration um and there was you know there's one or two interesting findings so if you if you put long-range interactions in uh, one thing that can happen is you can get jumps of linguistic forms from one city to another, and that's something which linguists have observed for a long time. And essentially what that means is that you can have a little isogloss sitting around one city, and uh, that can, that's the, the, the linguistic form in that city can then make a little jump to another one, and that initiates, spontaneously initiates another isogloss around the new city. So you can kind of get new bubbles popping up um, mm -hmm. as, uh, sort of out of nowhere. Um, yeah. and, and that's actually something that is observed in real linguistic changes, that you get this, you get this effect called hierarchical diffusion, where you have a, a sort of big and dominant uh, city invents a new linguistic form, and it then jumps. It completely misses out the countryside in between and jumps to another city uh, because of 
um, strong network links between the two cities. Uh, yeah, so that, that's that's been something. And also, you can you can ask the question: How much mis- mixing is can a system take before the dialects start disappearing? So you you find mm-hmm. there's a there's a there's essentially a phase transition where if you mix you, you know you mix people a little bit that can preserve the dialects. But there's a critical mixing level where you just start to destroy all sorts of locally distinctive speech forms and you start to get uniformity. So you can, you okay. can use the tools of statistical physics to explore what long-range interactions and mixing do. And, I mean, the, the model I've published in um, Royal Society Open Science, in a sense it was a, what physicists would call a toy model. It, it kind of it captured all, some of these phenomena and kind of it was quite tractable and you could explain what was going on. But again, the, the, the real aim is to get some super quality data and actually calibrate to that data and, you know, show that you can show that the model really does capture uh, the data. But obviously, that's just quite difficult because it's, it's quite hard to get hold of really high resolution linguistic data. I mean, there's loads of survey data okay. from the last hundred years, but linguistic service surveys mm-hmm. tend to be quite small. And, you know, what you really oh, yeah. want is a few hundred thousand data points, not a few hundred. Mm, yeah. But I think it's, it's, it's getting to be possible now. You know, I mean, you can, I mean, certainly linguists have been moving in that direction, you know, doing these online surveys or using Twitter to, um, you know, doing linguistic work on Twitter. So there's a chap called Jack Greaves at um, Birmingham who's done some really nice work on uh, analyzing Twitter data, so people are moving in that direction. But I think they, they need we need okay. some models, and that, that that's that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, that's where the physicists step yeah. in, right? So I have reached the end of my questions, but maybe uh, maybe you think I should have you know asked you about something else. No, no, I think I I think you've asked everything that needs asking, and I'm I've probably probably said said enough. All right. Uh, well, then, thanks very much. Uh, James, for uh, coming on the podcast. That's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And it's been very interesting uh, talking to you. Yeah, same here. So thanks again. I wish you a nice evening and a nice weekend and a nice uh, holiday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. All the best. (laughs) 